Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the BYOB podcast. That stands for Bring Your Own Blockbuster. I'm one of your hosts, Jack Hussey, and I'm joined, as ever, by my esteemed colleague, Mr. Ben Haynes. How are you doing, Ben? Yeah, good, mate. How are you? How are you getting on? I'm not too bad, mate. I'm not too bad. Like, you know, still getting through the kind of the, the COVID thing. I'm on about 75%, but I'm getting there, you know? It's, uh, it's, it's no joke, though, I think. Oh mate, I so I've done it twice, and it the second time it is worse than the first, and I don't know whether I've just got, I've become a worse patient over time, but I was so irritable, I was just so sick of it, like obviously sick of being sick, but I just couldn't stand it by the end. I was like, I just want to get better, just hurry up. So I know what it's you mean when useless. you get to that point. Where you're just, oh, yeah. so the feeling much. of being useless, you know. Anyway. Of, I mean, you Which are, I live my life with. Objectively, you are quite useless, aren't you? On, on when you when you got COVID, not in general. God, this isn't this this feels <laughs> too scathing, doesn't it? For what's supposed to be kind of a An light, attack. yeah, a light <laughs> kind of entertainment, attacked. you know, format. And here we are, Welcome really to the going for the, for the for the for the for the deep dark psychological cuts. But it's probably quite on theme for the film that we have. Uh, we have we have lined up today. I suppose we should also flag at this point moving forward. Like if people do have, we didn't flag it on the last pod, but if people do have questions, they absolutely should get in touch, right? So that we can tell them their opinions are bad. <laughs> <laughs> questions or comments? If you if you actually want to tell us our opinions are bad, just outright, please do. You know we're we're open to feedback, but try and make it nice. Come on, you know. Yeah, hundred percent. Um, but um, yeah, I reckon what should we do that from the we'll do that from the next episode, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Like I, I'm, I, this is the great thing about it. It's like we said in the first ep that whenever you or I come away from the cinema, or you sort of desperate to talk about it, and I, I love the fact that you can see something in a film that someone else doesn't see at all. So I, I can't wait to be told that I've got it completely wrong on <laughs> on some of these. Even if you're not going to agree with him. Oh, one hundred percent, absolutely yeah, exactly. won't. Yeah. <laughs> I'll be desperately stubborn. I'm sure. So at the top of the show, we were talking about, you know, with my, my deep dive into kind of psychologically dismantling you, Ben. Um, and I said that was kind of on point thematically for the film that we have lined up this week. Um, go on, why don't, why don't you give us the big reveal? I mean, I don't know why we're doing this. We told everyone at the end of we last remember. week's show <laughs> what we're going to be watching. But, you know, it's quite fun, isn't it? Just, quite fun to keep up. the. Yeah. The, it's like a, people like unboxing videos on YouTube, don't they? It's kind of like an unboxing video. You know yeah, what's it's coming out. ASMR. You know what's in the box, but they still want to watch you unbox it. Ba, ba, da, ba, ba, ba. Um, it's Whiplash. I am so... Do you know what, mate? I've been sort of... Whoa, 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 whoa. Not quite my tempo, Okay. <laughs> I've, been, I've been literally giddy this week to to hear a to hear you say that and and b just kind of to get into all of the juice of this film because there's so much there's just so much in it and i've started going down these sort of rabbit holes of various different themes off the back of it and kind of the the kind of backstory of the film and the editing and the the, the sound. I mean, the sound is just amazing. Um, and do you know what? The key reason why I chose it is because I think it's one of those things, one of those films, where you and I both like it. It it, it will stir something in us or stirs something in you when you watch it, and you can't help but be completely challenged by the central themes of it and and it makes you uncomfortable which i really mm. like i love that idea of you being moved to a place of discomfort by a film because ultimately you can have good films and you can have bad films but what's worse than any of that is films that do nothing to you whatsoever and you just come out and go like nah and this is the best of all worlds because it's could a great say, mate, film the type of film that you come out from and just say good job you know what I mean? <laughs> so spot on. Look, because I chose the film, um, it's your turn to do the kind of spoilers and courage section. So 60 seconds on the clock. Try, if you can, and encapsulate the whole film into 60 seconds, and then we'll break it down for ages. But let's see if you got it in the locker, mate. Okay, so Whiplash. It follows uh, a, a young... Aspiring jazz drummer, Andrew Nyman. He's at one of the top or the top music school in the country, New York City Schaefer Academy. Um, 
he's he's part of kind of one of the the just the bands that make up the the various different bands i'm sure there are at this college it seems to be a kind of tiered system um until one day when he's practicing after hours he finds that he is being watched by fletcher i can't remember his first name but fletcher this kind of dragon-like ruthless um band master who's in charge of the top tier the creme de la creme elite of the Schaefer Academy's various different bands. He invites Nyman, to, or Neiman as they call him, to, to come down and start rehearsing with them. Slowly but surely, Neiman starts to make a name for himself as a, as a part of this band. Be it intentionally or unintentionally sabotaging the, the position of the existing drummer um, quite newly into his tenure. Um, from this point on, we see a story of a young man who is not only desperate to win the approval of this dragon-like... Um, what is his name? Terence Fletcher. That's it. Terence Fletcher, who is... Yeah, he's ruthless. He's horrible to all of them. He shouts and screams, berates, belittles them. Um, all in this kind of... He strives for perfection. Every single thing, all of his movements, the way he dresses, it's all methodical, it's all precise. And he wants he wants that to see that echoed in all of his students. Nyman bites. He's 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 drawn to this, and it becomes a fixation. It becomes an obsession. But the further and further he goes down that rabbit hole, the the the, the more detached he becomes from reality. His relationship with his family suffers. His relationship with his girlfriend goes to pot. His mental health is in the gutter. His physical health is is damaged too. Those incredible, beautiful shots of his bloodied hands going into the jugs of ice as he really works his hardest to impress this evil teacher but obviously of course it all goes to it all goes to pot he's just he's burning the candle at both ends he ends up crashing his car he misses this crucial big huge band showcase that they're going to put on and he's kicked from the band his revenge then to Terence Fletcher who has driven him to this point driven him to this point of nearly killing himself is to report him to the school for bullying, for antagonising, and for his just his ruthless methods. Fletcher ends up being sacked from the school. Sometime later, the two of them end up reuniting in New York City. Fletcher is now leading a band within New York. They have the opportunity for a big musical showcase in which he wants Andrew Nyman to come and play for him. It seems as though they've reconciled things, but on the night of the performance, aghast Nyman is as he finds out Fletcher has sabotaged him. He sabotaged him knowing full well that this concert in particular is going to be watched by some of the biggest music scouts in the country. And as he says to them, these cats have a long memory. They won't forget if anybody messes up. So he's going to sabotage Neiman. He's, he's, he's going to ruin everything for him. He took him, to, like Neiman ruined Fletcher's career. He's going to ruin Neiman's career. And what you see from this point on after the sabotage is Neiman put in the performance of a lifetime. He is the new Buddy Rich. He is not just great, he is one of the greats. And Fletcher smiles at him, they give each other a nod and a kind of look right at the end and say, we did it. And so all that evil toxicity comes good in the end. What do you make of that, mate? That was definitely more oh, than 60 seconds, wasn't it? Yeah, I didn't know whether to come in with a gong and be like, right, 60 seconds is up. I've, 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 we should probably get ruthless with each other and do it. Do you know what I mean? Shall but, we? From now on, we'll say like 60 seconds. How much of the how much of the film did you manage to spoil? And we'll put like a percentage on it. But I think that was as good a kind of encapsulation of this film as you could have possibly done because there is so much to it. And mm -hmm. I think the... We could almost start at the end here, right? Because that moment that you talked about where there's that sort of knowing nod is literally the last scene of the film. There's a kind of like a knowing nod between the two of them and you see Neiman's face light up just a little bit. But you kind of can't see all of Terence Fletcher's face. He kind of looks like he's smiling. Yeah. But it, you, you can't quite see all of it. And then in that moment you're completely torn because you're like, oh, maybe he is that good. But equally, you're like, am I about to accept that being totally toxic and abusive is the way to get that performance out of someone? 
Well, it's funny, isn't it? Because I mean, uh, we've we've started this podcast to escape from football. However, within oh, the kind of so confines much, of our of our beloved Tottenham Hotspur, um, we've kind of seen both of these approaches. Right? We've seen the whiplash. We've seen the J.K. Simmons, the Terence Fletcher in your. Jose Mourinho's and your Antonio Conte's they're the kind of the berate the players the be nasty to them it hasn't worked for us but it's worked elsewhere however we've seen with our own eyes the big brother the arm around the shoulder in Maurizio Pochettino and that's also seemed to work so I think you know this this maybe not be entirely on point with what we're discussing now but there is a part of me that does question how much the filmmakers are glorifying that approach and that that makes me quite uncomfortable in a way that's one of those things i've had on reflection from what i love this movie i absolutely love it i think it's an absolute classic i think it's chazelle's best film by a very long way i don't think he'll ever better it but so i i I did i did no i just at the at the end of this i did reflect on it thinking what is the what am i supposed to what's the message i'm supposed to be drawing from this you know but I, lo- I loved that. I love that. I, 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 and it's so interesting that you jumped to the, the kind of um, the sport analogy because he, he I, I saw an interview of him where he basically said that it was meant to be kind of like a, uh, a boxing film or, or a dance film. Mm. We've kind of got this 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 back and forth sparring between the the two characters, and there is one point, isn't there, where it, right at the end, where he where he comes over to him and he, I think he says, "I'm gonna fucking kill you" or something like that, and then he smashes a symbol in his face. It sort of almost kind of hits him in the hits him in the head, hits yeah. Fletcher in, in the head. It's, that's right and at then, the very end when he's when he refuses to get off stage. Yeah, and I mean, and then there's also the bit where he kind of. Um, and Neiman spear tackles um, Terence Fletcher as well. When after there is that kind of a whole big clash on on stage as well, and it is incredibly challenging to to anyone to stare that message in the face that amazing things can come from incredibly toxic places, and both be uncomfortable with it but also accept that that is one route not necessarily the only route but it's one route to get that sort of elite performance Um, when he's but i I was just gonna say it's when neiman says to him right it's like is there a line you know do you have a line in this you know what if you put off the next charlie parker and he's just like yeah that's impossible because the next charlie parker wouldn't be put off you know, he wouldn't be dissuaded but that, from this. He, he genuinely, but that you can see at that time, but he genuinely believes that. Yeah. And it, this is in all walks of life, right? There's, there's these, this style of management or that style of encouragement or driving an individual forward. The people that do it, they don't ever actually stop to think. Or, 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 the, or they don't allow themselves to stop to think, is this the right thing? But we do get that amazing scene where uh, J.K. Simmons is, is reflecting on the fact that this kid has killed himself because of him. And he lies to the rest of the band to say, oh, he was in a car crash. And he sort of goes into his office and he's like, not now, leave me alone. Because he's just been told that this yeah. kid has essentially killed himself and and that's one of the things right it again like just in any walk of life it's one of the things that comes into my head when i meet these sorts of people or when i meet these types of characters that behave in that way i find myself thinking what are they like when they're at home or what are they like when they're away from this almost gladiatorial sort of arena style thing when they're just sitting reading a book well you, you, you get that little TV. S- that little snapshot into that with with terence fletcher because you see remember when one of his old uh band members comes back just to say hello to him i think he's there to watch one of the shows and he's got his kid with him his daughter and you can see yeah. fletcher there being very amiable are you playing piano well when you grow up a bit you're gonna have to come and play in my band you know he's like he's he's just he's very human he gives the guy a hug and you know so it's 
is it an affected performance or whatever? I mean, that's 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 the thing. But what I wanted to ask you on this, mate, right? Would that work on you? Have you have you yeah. had a manager like that? Does that work on you? That approach? A hundred percent. And that's why I found this so tough to watch, because I sat there and I am a, 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 as a person, I am. I would say I'm I'm probably the polar opposite of this in terms of do you know I I um I said to my said to my missus I said to her that she said oh you you, you you're you're not like that though why would that work on you and I I used um that line from meet the fuckers I would say like you know the Ferber method or the fucker method <laughs> I said in terms of the way that I treat people I fuckerize them yeah. <laughs> um, I, I, I'm, I'm such a hugger. I'm more, um, in terms of the Spurs analogy, I'm more Maurizio Pochettino than Jose oh, yeah. Mourinho. Um, but I think because of that, it, it annoyingly, I recognise, I recognise in myself that it does work on me because I have this streak within me where I'm like, I, I'm going to show you. I. I will prove you wrong. Um, and I think also, I think part of the reason why this this works, and I have to be really careful here because I know you're a lover of cats, but mm -hmm. cats scare the shit out not of me. Not the film. <laughs> not the, the, not the <laughs> Judy Dench and James Corden film. Just step by with Which the CGI arseholes. Just you know, feline right? erotica. Yeah. But um, <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I'm, I sort of, I, Jack, we should say for the record, Jack has cats. Like you are the owner of lovely cats. I have, I have two. I've, just, just again, I have two. I don't on, have like, in, a house. Fill in, fill in. I don't have a house, I don't have a house 17. full of them. 17. That's what I'm saying, you know, like they're not, you know, I'm not opening a drawer and one jumps out kind of thing, you know. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um yeah so i i like i i'm not i i've never have been big on cats but that was because when i was a kid um i, I was stroking a cat and it just suddenly turned and scratched me and like went for me and i think it bit me and scratched me because the, th the thing is with cats right if you get it slightly wrong they'll tell you where to get off mm -hmm. right but you can be sitting there calm as you like with them for hours and everything's fine and i think this is one of the things that i sort of saw in this film is that he behaved simmons jk simmons behaves like that in this film so terence fletcher at the beginning does this kind of pep talk where he's like listen you're meant to be here this is like this is this is you this is what you're all about you're here for a reason say it i'm here for a reason and so he sort of lures the character into this abusive relationship where he's thinking this guy's on my side and so i think that's probably part of the reason why it would work on me is because at first if someone made me think that i was on their side i'm i'm quite loyal so i would then be like oh well i need to kind of i need to sort of reward that that faith but you end up then chasing it you know you end up like yeah. chasing that that feeling again and it actually is is really really misplaced and misleading and toxic and dangerous but at the same time i think it you sort of see in the film it becomes like a weird obsession i don't know what about you would it would it work on you absolutely not no it, it's a, God, that's it's so an, interesting it's an approach that i entirely shut down to i absolutely entirely shut down to i, ca I can't be having it um and i don't know I'd, i find that but it's probably because i'm kind of like that with myself do you know what i mean like right, i am right I, it's it's such You're a tough it's enough a, on yourself it's the sort of thing you see on a kind of an on an instagram post isn't it like i'm my own i'm my own harshest <laughs> critic you know but <laughs> i probably am and yeah I, I don't really know where that comes from but i know that those kind of those big sort of personalities i will often like clash with a lot you know it's yeah, not it's yeah. not the approach that works for me but you know the thing that that you touched on just there and it kind of it makes me wince thinking about it. when you think about kind of because you're spot on when you say it's uh it's the start of like an abusive relationship it's it's the love bombing right yeah. at the very yeah. beginning yeah yeah and you see it as well in the when he first invites him to play in the kind of the there's a there's a term for it. I think it's like the premiere band or something. I can't remember what it is. It, is it core? Yes, it core? that's it. He invites him to core, yeah. 
And when he when he first starts playing that role, and he's like, "Yeah, go on, you know, just start, show us what you got." And he sort of says to everybody else, "Like, look, we got Buddy Rich here, you know, that kind of thing." And you yeah. see Neiman like light up and smile as in like, "Yeah, I'm smashing it." But he doesn't realise that like the rest of the room, the entirety of the room, know that Fletcher is playing with him. He knows he's fucking yeah. with him, and it kind of it's just it's showing you the kind of the naivety at, in that moment of of Neiman that desperate need to be kind of to have that approval from someone he deems great um yeah but it, it's funny because a lot is made of and you know of, obviously because he's he's such a big commanding dominating performance and character of Fletcher's but I don't feel that like much is ever said of like a lot of Neiman's actually pretty toxic traits as well. Oh my god, you know, 100%. The, the fact that he doesn't yeah, you know, he's he's borderline and I I get it. I'm, you know, I'm a I'm a barstool psychologist, but <laughs> a, a lot of a lot of his traits are fairly sociopathic, you know. He oh, 100%. Uh, his complete rejection of his father, you know, he just sees his father as just like useless, as pathetic. He doesn't when Fletcher is kind of like digging his father out, this kind of like this perceived failure that his father is, because he's because he says he's a writer, but he's not a great writer. It's just so yeah. beneath both Fletcher and Neiman, his own father. The this kind of idea that you know the fact the mother left is somehow a blot on his character. The fact he's just a teacher, um, and that he's really what he's so terrified of Neiman is being like his father. He's terrified of that, but it's it drives him to this really he he's basically you know a lot of people say there are certain institutions and certain types of people that will sense a vulnerable person or they will sense somebody who is there for the taking and i do think with neiman and with fletcher the, there is that perfect there is that perfect balance because what, what i also did want to ask you mate about this because it was one thing that stood out for me that I, I guess I hadn't really, I guess, thought about. Because I've always just watched the film for, for, for leisure. You know, I've, I've seen it probably three or four times. And I watched it yeah, when yeah. I knew we were going to be recording this. So it's fresh in the memory again. And watching it through a slightly more kind of analytical lens, I guess, with one mind on one eye on what we're doing here. One mind. <laughs> with my double minds. Um, <laughs> but we, uh, the, the, the very first scene... Like when Fletcher walks in and and What's sees playing? like Neiman Nyman Neiman playing. Sir? What year are you? I, 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 I do you think he you sees play? something in Neiman in this whole time? Do you think at the, so at the ver from the, from the very play. beginning, from the very very beginning, do you think he has you actually actively play? seen something in him because he's there? Whether it because it's because of his playing or it's because he's there late after everybody else has left. You know, the lights are all out, but he's still there hammering away at the drum kit. Is there something there in Fletcher that's thinking, right, there's my putty. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, a hundred percent. And one that is, firstly, yes, that's absolutely what, what I took from it. But secondly, I think the other thing within that was that even in that first exchange, I feel like you got so much from about the characters from from literally that opening section. When when J.K. Simmons's character says, "Did I say stop playing?" So already you can kind of feel that he's got that cat-like ability to just scratch out mm. if he wanted to. It's, it's there. And also mm. that Neiman is clearly practicing either after hours or before hours and maybe shouldn't necessarily be there because the first thing he does is apologize. So you're getting this, you're getting this idea that here's a kid who's prepared to go above and beyond. Mm. And then here's this guy who he's desperate to impress because immediately you can see from his body language. And then also this guy is going to be a ruthless kind of taskmaster with it and, and actually sort of beat him quite literally around the face to... to see if he wants it enough and it made me it, it just made me think straight away I, I wrote down on my notes i said 30 seconds of terence fletcher and you feel like you know everything about him yeah. and obviously part of that is down to the performance of, of jk simmons 
and the, I mean he won he won the Oscar for it right for best supporting actress but one of the other things that jumped out at me straight away he was in unreal shape like he was jacked oh yeah yeah lo- big time and that so totally adds to the character because yeah. he's kind of it, it, on, on all the interviews and all the press that he did around it I watched a load of it over the last few days and he kind of like let his hair grow out a little bit and I think he got a bit of facial hair and he just suddenly looked really sort of soft and almost granddad like but in the film he looks like the devil he's he chiseled yeah he really does like the though. devil yeah all in black yeah, as well always yeah and it's frightening like it's so frightening so when he's when he's ramping up the aggression and the anger and I mean, I know it's one of your favourite scenes, but the whole not quite my tempo scene, with dra- dragging just a hair, like that, that just sort of, you can feel your body start to get tighter and tighter and tighter, but you can also see it on the characters. And it's so true what you said around the orchestra and the, the rest of the orchestra, because there's these little jump cuts and edits where it suddenly flashes to a member of the orchestra who just looks worried. Yeah. And they just yeah. look concerned. And then you suddenly are like, oh, okay, what's happening? What's happening? And, They're all kind of like think, eyes to the floor, aren't they? They're like, please don't. Okay, he's not picking on me. That's fine. You know. Yeah, and I mean, what is the name of that? What's the name of the kid who doesn't realise that he's not out of tune, and he tells him, "Stop fucking looking down." It's, there's not a Mars bar there. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's it, it, he calls it's him Elmer Fudd, I mean, doesn't he? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's, it's not a Mars like, bar down there. Yeah, <laughs> but it's but it, at the same time, it's kind of like. It's quite scary. It's quite frightening that you. Have it's awful. This... It's terror. Like it's terror. It's that kind Look, of thing where you think, in that position, what would I do? And that's it's that kind of thing of like. No I think that's what s- summons that kind of real visceral reaction in me of like it's fight or flight in that situation. If somebody like that is in your yeah, face, the, it's kind the of question it's hard is, to to keep it together, right? If you if you're in that fight or flight style mode. <laughs> The thing that I think was so horrendous is that he made it clear if you do fight back, he'll kick you out. But then weirdly, he kind of lets him back in again. It's it's so manipulative. Like you said, it's just it's the start of a totally abusive relationship. I mean, what did you think from that opening opening exchange? Did you think that that it was the the groundwork there or do you think that he didn't know he was going to be that good he was just sort of testing him I, th- I think like I say I think in him he sees that like there's 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 putty there's something he can work with he's like okay there's a there's a kid here who is here hours after class he sounds decent enough probably not perfect he's probably you'd assume that if he's in the top music school in the country though he's probably of a certain standard and it's just again, I guess it's kind of like just casting a line, isn't it? It's casting a line out there and seeing how does how does this kid respond to this? And then the next day he sees him peering through, looking into his class, and he's probably thinking, Okay, all right, I've sufficiently kind of gotten his interest. And it's funny, you know, in the whole not my tempo scene, the infamous one when he ends up throwing a chair at Neiman's head at the end of it, I actually went down a, a Reddit thread um with just some musicians talking about it. And they said that like He's playing it perfectly. He's not rushing. He's not dragging. He's playing it absolutely perfectly. So they're saying from their perspective, and it's interesting to get that perspective, they're saying from their perspective, this more than highlights the fact that this is like an almost like army type technique of deconstructing the ego of an individual so they are completely within your hands. That that they almost deny the their own reality that Neiman, Neiman doesn't know if he's rushing or dragging because he's not actually doing anything wrong. So he doesn't know what to say, but he just ends up, you know, going along with, with what's I'm happened. I'm upset. Yeah, and you see the <laughs> makings of it there, that he's been broken and he is now being reformed in the image of J.K. Simmons, cause I, or Terence Fletcher, I should say. And it, 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 we talk about that kind of in the, in the last scene. So in the last scene, he completely goes against like so he's been he's been you know he's been tricked by by Fletcher 
Fletcher's not, yeah, the song Upswinging or whatever it was, he makes an absolute hash of it. It's embarrassing. Even the other band members are, yeah, like you say, with those edits, those nice again. The telling edits where the other, where they bring the uh, the other musicians into it just at the right times, you know, because the majority of this film, and it's very interesting that you say boxing match, because the majority of the film is Miles Teller and J.K. Simmons. It really is. Like, I would say 90% of screen time is them. And when they use other characters within the film, it is all very selective and it's done very well. And in that last scene, when he is ruining up swinging and it's not working, you can see them all looking and you can see, you can feel the shame and the embarrassment all growing on Nyman. He goes off stage. He has the kind of the hug and the kiss and the patronizing pat on the head from his dad, who's kind of like, oh, well, don't worry, son, kind of thing. And that's almost like suddenly... He has that feeling, that twinge of like, Charlie Parker wouldn't be put off here. And yeah. goes, and it, it, but even though you think it's like an act of autonomy, an act of defiance, it's an absolute act of being complicit with the wishes of J.K. Simmons after he put it to him in that way. A, the real Charlie Parker. After, after J.K. Simmons had said to him, or Terence Fletcher, you know, I keep switching between the two, but. As Terence Fletcher said to him in the bar when they were kind of reconciling things, ah, I never had my Charlie Parker. Oh well, kind of thing. But Charlie Parker wouldn't be put off. He's suddenly there in his head. So it, it, it's almost like that's what he's been directed to do. When he goes back on stage, he starts hammering away on the drums and Fletcher is like, what are you doing? You know, and like you said, he says to him, like, I'll fucking kill you. He smashes the symbol <laughs> in his face as in like get out of my face the delivery just, on that it, by the way it, it, yeah but it's almost like it's kind of like waking him up right it's like look at what i'm doing look at what you've built i am your monster i am doing it and you can see it starts to fall into place and when when fletcher starts when his own ego when his own sort of threatened ego dissipates he's suddenly like he is mine and you see it when he when he snaps into it he starts to control what Nyman's doing. He guides him and he tells him what to do and Nyman follows suit. And then that's it. And, and they have formed that, that perfect, perfect relationship um, that is as a result of abuse though, you know? It's, yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. it's real, it's a real, it's a real conflicting feeling because there, there are those, you know, I, I feel it is one of those things I feel on a personal level, you know, especially like the stuff that's, picked it in on screen in whiplash i think you, you can't condone that like there's no it doesn't matter if you think somebody's going to be a great drummer or not you, you, you can't be acting the way he's done uh, the way he has done throughout that throughout that film but objectively you know you you see these stories you hear again we'll use a, a sport analogy but you see these you know these great coaches you know jose Mourinho back in his day pep Guardiola, someone like that today there is there's a question there around um determinism right and the idea of did you have any free will in in that so at the end when neiman is sort of playing his solo it's like are, are is he doing this because he wants to or is this all part of the the grand plan of jake simmons and then equally on the, on the flip of that it's that really uncomfortable question of just even though it's totally unacceptable because it brings about that performance are you able to write it off? Do you know I mean? Are you able to kind of just mm. go, okay, well, he got there. It's so ugly. It's so there's, horrendous. There's, like, there's, there's a bit of that, like, um, you know, it's kind of, it's, it's one of the most cliched sources to, to, to kind of contextualize things with now because it's so overtrodden. But 1984, Winston Smith, the, the protagonist of that, you know, he's spent the entire film or the entire, the entire film, the entire book, looking for a way to bring down Big Brother, to, to break it, to, to, to smash the system. Um, that his, his want to be free, his desire to be not sort of chained to, to this oppressive method of control um, sees him try to bring the system down. But then right at the very end, you know, the, 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 there's the idea that he ends up just submitting to it that I think like one of the final, I think the final line of the book is he realised he loved the Big Brother, and it's just that kind of the Stockholm syndrome. There is some of that I think with with Neiman. It's like it is a destruct. Like I said, 
a few moments ago. Oh, it's Buddy Rich here, kind of belittling him in front of their. Well, and, and did you notice they're playing slower as well? Yeah, yeah, he's, yeah. He's yeah. slowed down the tempo for him. Exactly. And he's for talking the, about for being Buddy Rich. What's he calling him a squeaker, a squealer, or yeah, something the squeaker. like that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The squeaker. So it, it, it is that Neiman's going to be great, but he's not great. He's a vessel for Fletcher to be great. But is that, you know, is that how it's supposed to work, really, ultimately? You know, was the yeah. one of these dragon type people behind every kind of great person? Maybe so, you know? Oh, that's so horrid, isn't it? Like, that's so horrible that that's, that that is even a, even a, possibility and i don't want to believe that that is the case because like you said like it would never work on you that style of someone being like that but the, the one other thing here just while we're on the subject of him kind of turning around and almost being like i'm going to show you there was this other thing that really stuck with me over the course of the film was that there was all these little tests for mm. for miles teller's character for neiman there was all these l little moments where you're trying to work out whether he's ruthless enough, ruthless enough to get to where Fletcher wants him to get, mm. right? So at the beginning of the film, Fletcher brings in the the, the ginger drummer to yeah. kind of just basically to just mug off Connolly or whatever um, it is, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, Connolly. Yeah, yeah. He brings it brings him in just to mug off Neiman, just just to like mess with him and, and to get in his head but there's this little moment where Connolly goes oh can I can I borrow your drumsticks and he hands them over but then later on in the film we see him turn up and the bus breaks down so he's going to be late for the gig but instead of just saying to one of the other drummers give me your drumsticks I'm going on he rushes back to go and get his drumsticks and he has to go and pick them up and then there's the, the whole sort of scene with the folder where he's told to look after the folder and we have to try and work out whether he deliberately leaves the folder so that it will get lost so that he gets his opportunity or whether he just accidentally loses or, it, you know. Or if Fletcher took it because, you know, yeah, before yeah. that point, Fletcher makes a point of saying, if anybody loses these or whatever, I'll personally kill you. And yeah, then yeah. all of a sudden it goes. But it, again, is this... Is this all part of Fletcher's grand plan of knowing that, that I can't remember the other character's name, but the drummer, the core drummer at that point, can't remember without the music. Again, it's that baptism of fire for Neiman. Right, I'm going to chuck Neiman in there now. Let's see how he does. It's yeah, maybe it's all part of his grand plan. He doesn't chastise him for losing the folder either. He he he. He's like, oh well, why would you give your folder away? You know, yeah. so it, it, it's so again. This is the the whole thing of that abusive and toxic relationship, and you can recognise so many of these little telltale parts of it. It's like the gaslighting, the the kind of toxicity of the way that he talks, like physically abusing him, sort of slapping him in the face, and and like you said, half half the time it seems as though he hasn't even made an error. That he's being punished just to sort of break him down and absolutely split him um one of the other things that i was gonna gonna actually chuck to you on and you mentioned it earlier on but miles teller's character being actually a little bit abusive towards people in his family how good is that scene at the table where they're sat there and they've got the two kind of like I think that the, the, maybe an uncle says, here he is, Mr. Tom Brady or whatever it yep. is. Yep. And he's like, and, they play Division and... 3. <laughs> <laughs> it's so good. But but also there's, um, there's something that I recognised in there that kind of, I don't know whether it, it did the same for you, but struck a little bit of a nerve with me. It was this idea that um, creativity is just unimportant. Yeah, you know, 100%. the idea of that him... Him trying to explain, like, no, but actually, like, I'm in this incredible band. But, but it, I think it's also, it's a kind of, it's a, it's a, it's a, it should be a bit of a, a, a sign for, for Neiman as well, because it's like, it's also showing you how subjective the idea of greatness is, you know, because, yeah, with the idea that he's playing drums for the top music school, 
doesn't compute with the every man if you like versus somebody who could be even <laughs> tenuously called a college football player you know it, it, it's it just shows you where people place their values and, and, and what they deem to be great or of worth and so yeah i definitely i definitely do know what you mean on that side of things but it, it, equally i think it's kind of it's just it should be something of a wake up call for neiman at that point to be like look you know it's all well and good that i can try and push myself to to be the best i can possibly be in my field but giving away my entire life just so because he's so fixated on he's saying i would rather know that when i'm gone there will be people sat around a dinner table talking about me it's like but you won't know that mate you know you're not going to know that and it's kind of it's it's that it's that it's that strange dichotomy that i think many of us face you know the the sacrifices we make in our in our lives in the here and now the the times that we're neglectful in relationships with anybody you know that i should have called my mum this week kind of feeling you know but you've just been busy because you've been so sucked into the here and now the pursuit of whatever not even not even of greatness of just even sometimes just getting by right that other things can fall by the wayside and sometimes you just need that little kind of like prod maybe to to bring you back to reality and it's 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 a shame that because he kind of has that nice sort of safe space with his dad you know they go to they've got their little routine they go to the cinema together they have the popcorn and the chocolate raisins on top of it and all that type of thing but i just think there's so much that he almost like detests about the quiet simple life you know he sees it there's a, there's a scene it's always it's, it's quite sort of um sad in a way really like you see his dad his somebody walks when they're sat in the cinema somebody walks into his dad they they knock his dad around the back of the head with the popcorn and his dad apologizes his dad's done nothing wrong he sat there and the guy knocks into him and his dad apologizes to the guy you know it's that kind of like and i think the idea of of being kind of so subdued and so just resigned to your station in life it just doesn't work for it just doesn't work for Neiman and he's almost driven kind of mad by it and whether that is maybe that is in part a scar with that comes with the failing of his parents marriage you know it is touched upon but it's not really ever deep dive yeah there's never really a deep dive into it we never really get much and this is this is the thing that's so that I think is so brilliant about Whiplash is that they're two characters really that we're not ex it's never explained to us who they are we just have to watch and draw our own conclusions really about about who they are it's a very it's a very real and a very raw kind of characterization that that takes place on screen i feel do, do you know what i mean yeah oh absolutely and and you're sort of left wondering as well whether that discomfort that Miles Teller's character has with mediocrity is that caused by Fletcher or is that just something that he has in common with Fletcher mm. you know that whole that whole discussion of well the, the whole thing of him shouting about him about his dad and shouting about him being sort of weak and soft yet at the same time once you've seen at the dinner table um Miles Teller's character saying, oh, yeah, but I want to be remembered. I want people to talk about me at dinner tables or whatever. There is then that scene where Fletcher, after he's found out about the kid dying, plays the music back to the class and says, oh, I just want to tell you all he was a beautiful player mm. or, or, or something to that effect. It's almost and like so, he's relieving his own guilt, right? It's, it doesn't yeah, feel like yeah, he's yeah. doing it because he actually wants to pay tribute to the kid. It's like... He is. He feels that somehow this kind of token gesture will somehow rem remove his sort of exercise him a little bit. That. Precisely, yeah, yeah. And it, it's so. I mean, it's so true. It's such a. It's such a strange. I really enjoyed the scenes with his dad. I really loved seeing that uncomfortable relationship, even though it does make you uncomfortable. And I think one of the really beautiful things about that is that when J.K. Simmons got his Oscar, he didn't say a huge amount in his speech 
um, I, I absolutely love watching Oscar speeches. By the way, I don't know why. I've just got a real, <laughs> I've just got a real like thing for it on on YouTube. I'll just kind of go back to a random year and watch four or five of the acceptance speeches. Just sort of, it's almost like a time capsule because they're all the costumes that, or, or sorry, the costumes, but the, what everyone's wearing, all of the kind of like the the sort of pomp and of it all and um, the fanfare, I guess, of, of it all is very of its time. So I kind of found myself going back and watching him getting his Oscar. And he does the standard stuff. I think he thanks the Academy and I think he thanks his family. But then he just sort of takes a second and then says, wherever you are, call your parents, call your mum, call your dad, make sure you get in touch. And it really, it really hit me. Like it hit me really hard because I sort of thought... The usual thing is for people to say, oh, and I wouldn't be here without my parents. But he sort of flipped that on its head. And um, yeah, it just was a bit of a bit of a dagger for me because I, I mean, I see my parents absolutely loads at the moment. But I definitely know there's been periods of my life when I've probably been the bad side of Neiman. I've probably been that person that's so head down in what I'm doing in my career yeah. That the idea of coming up for air and actively taking a second to go, how are you guys doing? How can I be what you need me to be in your life as opposed to what I need you to be to me in, in mine? Um, it Yeah, just really rocked me. And, and th that's why I kind of loved those scenes with his dad is that even though he has that whole comfort in the routine he's also it's also juxtaposed with the idea that he's sort of uncomfortable with his dad being just a, a college teacher or whatever um yeah is, I, it's is just that, brilliant mate like, is brilliant. that partly because I, what i wanted to touch on before we did move on because i'm conscious of the time um on this pod when you said at the start it, it's a film that makes you uncomfortable is it is it because of things like that is that what it's wrapped up in yeah, I guess so. I guess I like guess that self reflect. It's like holding up a mirror to your own. It's a mirror. Toxic yeah. traits, 100%. right? A hundred percent. Like you recognize the bits. You recognize the bits. I think. I think our generation. I mean, I'm I'm someone that absolutely despises Love Island, um, and I I can't stand those types of of programs, right? But I think the reason why our generation has such an obsession with those types of programs is because they watch them and they think well that could never be me you know i'm, yeah. I'm just, look at look at these ridiculous it's the victorian freak show in 2023 look at these outlandish characters that could never be me yeah they're ripped and jacked and very good looking and all of this stuff but that i mean i would never act like that so so that it, it, it's comforting because you watch it and you go oh well it's not that's i wouldn't act like that so it's okay mm. Whereas why this is kind of so uncomfortable and, and sort of gloriously uncomfortable, I really enjoy the discomfort, is because, like you asked me at the beginning, like, would that style of management work on you? I, I sort of want to watch it and say, no way. Like, I would never let someone get in my head like that. But sometimes people do get in your head like that. Mm -hmm. And you, and it's not just in it's not just in what you do for a living. It can be relationships with friends. You know, you can be in friendships like that where people take a lot and they don't give anything back but you you never think that you would be the the person that would accept that you know you never think you'd be the person that would just kind of like be pushed around but it it, it like i mean to, to your to your question uh, yeah i think that is the i think that's the beauty in it i think that's why it's it's a lovely feeling of discomfort because it challenges you to ask yourself those questions about whether there's parts of your character that you don't like or whether there's parts of characters of other people around you that you think oh god maybe that's that's not quite what i want you know Is, uh, and that kind of really did something for me i don't know what about you yeah i mean it definitely it, it musters a lot of feelings in me um it's a uh, i find it i find it quite a, a sad film in many ways do you know what i mean because there's a part of me that like i kind of i think about like my early 20s and i think about you know i just i just graduated out you know done my film degree sort of working on kind of film sets just doing the sort of you know being a runner that type of thing 
writing and producing my own short films on the side and just kind of having that relentless kind of hunger and pursuit of I have to be somebody I have to do I have to make something of myself I have to be more than just me do you know what I mean I, I'm not good yeah. enough I'm not good enough and it just becoming like a real kind of like a, 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 a kind of a pursuit of something that I'm not even sure what do you know what I mean it's like really yeah. like it, it, and there were certain sort of career things that didn't really go my way and it took me to like quite a quite a sort of bad place really in, in my in my early 20s and it, it almost sort of like made me sort of take a, a step back from doing all of those things like from doing from like really pushing myself and really like thinking like okay I can't really go out as much I can't really see my friends because I've got to keep writing because it, there was this old like it was an old Scorsese quote that was just like look if you want to get into showbiz if you want to get into films all I can tell you is right shoot can right shoot can right shoot can and you just got to keep doing it and that was kind of the process that I was going through and when you don't see like yourself kind of having like making tangible strides making tangible progress or having kind of near misses and stuff like that it really drives you into like a bad place of like I am not good enough I am like useless. I am worthless in many ways, you know, because I have devoted so much of my time and energy to this thing, this singular pursuit. And because I am not getting to where I want to in that, I am therefore useless, you know? And it's it's not it's not a good place to be in, right, at all. And so watching a film like this, it's kind of like in a in a stranger I can sort of relate to a lot because he's 19 at the time and I sort of think, yeah, I was probably around that sort of age 20 my early 20s and stuff and thinking about kind of like the way I sort of treated myself and probably treated those around me it does muster like you were saying a lot of those kind of uncomfortable feelings and I think now as I get older the the thing is it's like it's almost like there's a part of you where you reassess you know you get older and on with time you start to think well I do certain things because I want to, because I enjoy them, because I derive joy from doing this. It's not really so much about like, can I be great or not? If you can be great, if you see you see like a, a movie like Everything Everywhere All at Once, you know, that's kind of, it's been a real kind of, you know, a real sort of labour of love, a real passion project that has been recognised, but it had it not won a load of Oscars, I don't think anybody involved with that film would feel that they'd done anything less important, you know? And I think yeah. it's kind of, it's it's one of those things. And I think that's probably why, you know, when I was sort of saying to you at the start, why I struggle with the message behind the film, because in a way I kind of feel like it's presented as in like, it doesn't really matter if you're kind of good or not. You have to be great. You have to be one of the best by any means necessary. And maybe that's not kind of what the filmmaker is suggesting to the viewer, but it's it's definitely I don't think it's presented in a wholly negative frame. And I'm I'm not saying I'm not saying that means that it, it doesn't have a valid perspective on this type of thing. I'm just saying on a personal level, when I watch that I reflect on that and I think like, you know, that makes me kind of uncomfortable. Again, it, it almost almost like musters a few of the old feelings of like why didn't I carry on? Why didn't I push myself? Why didn't I fight through all those kind of negative bad feelings or that? sort of dark place I was in why didn't I push through and really kind of like maybe now maybe now I could be some great like you know film director or something but it, it, do you know what I mean it's it's funny it's a funny yeah, yeah. it's but, a funny but, place but, it drives you to like um I think because I w will quite happily do this for another hour um just before <laughs> we finish up I want to make sure that we get in producer Purdy's point because he is um he's really interested in the technical side of the film and um, both the grading and the editing are one exquisite, but mm. they lend so much to the film as well, don't they? Mm -hmm. Well, it's just it's that it's that warmth, right? The 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 main sort of the sort of sepia tone that you see it all through. It just evokes that kind of the world of jazz, right? You know, like it's yeah, sat in smoky, sure, dimly lit rooms, right? Sat in some New York jazz club, or even in Ronnie Scott's in Soho. If, back in you know the 60s 50s 60s with a big cigar 
that kind of low lighting it, it just it draws you into God, it that's such an image isn't it yeah so you can see it so crystallized in in, in your mind like as you exactly. were saying like cigar you can kind of think of s- people sitting there drinking with a drink bourbon in front of them. you know like y- it's y- exa- exactly and it, and it, it, I mean, it it's just, so incredible it, it, that that's done with the, the, the tones well it is because it's it's again it's it's the whole kind of it's the juxtaposition in tone that is present throughout the entire film right because you do have these warming relaxing calming tones and they're so just kind of jarred by this fury this anger this like you say this demonic figure in Fletcher and the funny thing is do you, do you know what's so funny that one of the decisions that I, I, I love that they make from that the filmmaker has made and I, to me it must be conscious because whenever they're in the jazz world like we say it's these sepia tones it's these dull lights but when they're in the real world it's bright it's plastic it's saccharine you know it's yeah. kind of when he's yeah. driving to the concert when he hires the car it's bright lights it's almost natural light it's horrible Very it's blue jarring almost, isn't it? yeah you know when he's sat in that coffee shop breaking up with that you know the sort of the the, the lovely girl that he's in a relationship with and he just you know he just breaks up with this so callously you know like it's just nothing yeah. like he's so robotic in that and i think the, the you know the tone and everything matches that exactly for me but but, but do you know what's amazing is that that for me is like very inverted you know because usually those warm tones make you feel safety and and comfort yeah actually it, it, instead it kind of almost is quite hellish the 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 way those some of those scenes play out um and I guess it's that kind of, of that, like it's the, like brick Brickian theater in a way, like that kind of like you know yeah. the, conjuring a really horrific image alongside something that's hilarious or whatever, you know, usually parring two opposites to create this awkward, uncomfortable effect yeah and 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 it's kind of I think the speed of the editing as well, when you get into those that they all like I said before, they almost become like fight scenes with the yeah with the orchestra uh, but there's the th- there's even an image of it kind of feels like a you know when a boxer is in the, in his corner and he sort of spits out his gum shield and, and a load yeah. of spit yeah. that they even have that coming from the brass section in the in the film and you sort of get these really fast like cut 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 as as the as the music's going along and it's not Nyman's so fists so into the ice water you know the ble- the bleeding yeah, fists yeah 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 it is such and, a, and, and an amazing shot that I love it so much. That kind of it's amazing, ultra slow mo, it? you know, it's almost like you know, a thousand frames a second kind of thing, just slowly plunging into the ice water and the sound of it all. It's just that that's one of the, the I mean, one of the well, big things. Yeah. It's the sound design is like exquisite. I believe it won an Oscar for that, or maybe it won the Oscar for oh, soundtrack. Yeah. I'm not sure. One of the, let's have a look quickly. What did it win its Oscars for? Um, but the sound, the yeah, sound yeah, sa- it won it in in sound sound design. Yeah, so it's oh, amazing. Yeah, well, and and when he does his little, it's one of the things we haven't mentioned yet. Is when he does his little whip thing with his hand, where he almost plucks the air from yeah. the air. Do you know what I mean? He Sucks the life out of it. Doesn't grabs it. Just pull. Yeah, pulls. It's like he's tearing the sound out of the film, and it Not just suddenly tempo. goes silent. It just. Oh, so good. Um, right, okay. We 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 gotta we gotta fly on because otherwise we'll be here all day. The ultimate question: fine wine or war crime? Again, it's difficult. Is it? I mean, to me, it's still, it's a it's a fine wine to me. However, I would be interested to see it. And I, I you know, I'm not saying this in the old man shouts at Cloudway, but I would be interested to see if this project in its current state would get the green light in 2023 like i say just just from those themes yeah. of like toxicity of almost glorifying kind of uh you know destroying somebody's mental health in that fashion because i think even this movie is only i think it's nine years old it's about to you know be, i think it's 2014 it's not even that old but i would say even in that time especially around this subject and mental health and kind of being kind and everything has uh has changed massively so so i'm not saying that the film wouldn't get made but i do wonder if there would need to be more of a damning light placed upon fletcher's behavior perhaps do but do I, you I, think at the same time i don't even do think, think they're kind of, 
I mean, Chazelle apparently based... This is one of his rawest films. Apparently it's based on a lot of his experience. So is it Juilliard, I want to say? That's kind of what this Academy is based upon loosely. Um, so whether it's self-aware or not, I think it's maybe just a kind of presentation of what that kind of world is like, the reality of it. And it's it's funnily enough, like one of my... Um, one of my very good friends his uh ex-partner she was a she was a very sort of you know high-end professional ballerina she used to you know tour around the world with all the the biggest and you know ballets going and things like black swan and whiplash she just she couldn't watch it she didn't want to watch it because she was just like it's just these these people are like this they're demonic and I, I can't watch this for entertainment because this Too is my life. Home. It's my life, you know, yeah. and it's been my life since I was a child and it's, you know, it's, it's, it's not nice. So whether or not, I, I, do you, I mean, do you think it's, do you think it's, it's self-aware? I, 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 I don't doing? know that. So that for me is crucial to whether you can say it's, it's in terms of the aging process, whether mm. it's leaning towards fine wine or war crime, because if it is self-aware and it is looking at, the it, it's looking at the events play out through the lens of someone saying this exists this is almost like a either a, a warning or a heads up or this is literally how things can play out then i think you go okay fair enough that that all of the horrible stuff that uh jk simmons character does throughout the film you don't forgive it but you're alert to it and you sit there and go that is grim but equally i think the fact that like you said there are at least 10 examples that both you and i could give in the current football landscape of this type of leadership or management mm. is a little bit unsettling and it is a little bit uncomfortable still because there's there's a, there's a there's a lot in there around toxic masculinity there's a lot in mm -hmm. there about abusive relationships and and maybe the strength and the kind of the, the 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 kind of i guess wonderful filmmaking and the reason why it's such an encapsulating sort of raw and um moving film both positive and negative is because you see the brutality of it and i like you said, I wonder whether you would get away with that brutality now. Do you, do you know one of the most alarming things about it is, mate, is that there is still, and this is, you know, I, I openly admit this to myself, this is probably a, a, a failing, a, a toxic trait of my own. But still, though, when you watch that final scene, when you see the point that he's been driven to, and you see his own father looking on aghast, not even really recognising who his own son is anymore, you know, as he's there in this kind of maniacal fit-like state almost on stage, hammering away at the drums. It just, it still sends a bit of a shiver down your spine. When they exchange that glance and they look at each other, there is that bit of you where you're like, this is a triumph. This is yeah. amazing. I've, it's incredible. I've won, but at what cost? Yeah, but you you know, and that's maybe <clears throat> something that's whether it's in us or whether it's behaviour that's been internalised because of the, the the what our society values. It's 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 interesting, and it, you know, like the kind of the, the stuff I was saying earlier. It does it does make me introspect a lot. But it's a film that, for all its you know, for all its negatives, I hold very dearly. I do. I I love the film. I absolutely love it from the you know in a technical aspect the music the world the theme of it all and just the performances you know <clears throat> normally we do our standout performers the mvps but it feels it felt almost pointless to do that this week right because it's it, we know who it is um yeah but i think we've i think we've covered that one off off pretty nicely mate yeah. um do you want to should we find out what everybody else thought of it yeah absolutely <clears throat> 
absolutely i'm so so keen to hear what other people because i'm sure right. there's a load of stuff that we've missed and hopefully we can maybe i don't know maybe we can grab grab a, a load of comments and, and smash through some what? smash through a few next week but let's get the ratings in what so, um <laughs> what what do you reckon imdb IMDb, do you, do you want to know? Because I have them all up here, so I'll. I'll, I'll oh, I'll do you have them? Okay, I you. don't. I, yeah. But like, IMDb is going to be. IMDb is usually overly critical, right? So this is like an eight out of ten, maybe. Eight point five. Whoa, that's high. Yeah. For IMDb, that's high. Is it in the IMDb top two hundred and fifty? Let's have a look. How do we see that? Um, it's yep, yeah, one hundred and fifty-four. Oh wow! Okay, yeah, that, one five four. I mean, that's that's pretty impressive. Um, what was next? We'll go Rotten Tomatoes. Eighty percent. Ninety-four percent, maybe. Oh wow! Okay. Yeah. So this has been well received. Tomatoes. Yeah. Less kind of uh, troubling for the critics than um, than Mrs. Doubtfire and yeah. then Metacritic. <laughs> Metacritic, what was is Metacritic done out of ten? It's a percentage. As is well. it a percentage? So Metacritic maybe just actually Metacritic high as well. Eighty five percent. Eighty nine. Wow. And it's yeah, got so their little is... a little badge as well. A Metacritic must see as well. So this is kind <laughs> of in terms of the aging thing. It's it's sort of aged in a way that people obviously feel more comfortable with the themes within it being discussed, I guess. Um, but um, what about for us? What about how many pop? How many BYOB popcorns are you giving it? Mate, see, I think I'm going to be an absolute mess with this with our rating system because most of these films, I'm just going to be like. Five popcorns out of five, and uh, but that's fine. I like <laughs> for me. Fine. For me, this is another five popcorns out of five, mate. Mrs. Yeah. Now five whiplash. You know, get, get, find you a guy that can do both. You know, that's uh, yeah. Uh, Nothing if not consistent. I'm I'm the same though. This is this this film this week. I've, I've taken so much joy. I'm almost a little bit sad that we've now done the pod and we're sort of closing the chapter on this film there's been so many nice moments this week like you say i could have spoken about this for another hour easily you know yes i could maybe we'll set and up i'm sure a people will we'll set up a patreon <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah exactly two episodes I'm, I'm in sure there'll be people <laughs> <laughs> love that um yeah i'm sure loads of people will send in stuff for us to to get and hopefully we'll get through the the best few next week um so the big question what are we watching next week jack I'm gonna go with, and it's it's one I've wanted to revisit for a few years now. P Pulp Fiction. Oh, oh, back of the net. Yeah, you happy with that, that one? That is so. This is. I, I think this might be my favourite bit of the pod. I think this it, is it, like because there's such because we generally don't there. tell each other before, right? This is yeah, the thing yeah, as well. Just to no anyone, idea. anyone listening or watching. We, we, we are doing that unboxing thing at the start. We don't know. We genuinely don't know what the other one's going to oh, pick. Oh, so. man, I love that. I'm glad what you like shout. that. Do, do you know what's going to be horrible, oh. though, Ben? The day when it's like, oh. Uh. <laughs> do you know when, when, one oh, of really? them, when one of us, like, <laughs> suggests the film and the other one's like, oh, do we have to? <laughs> you know? Really? Really? Yeah. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm so up for that. I'm so up for that. And, and do you know what? You watch them in a different way as well, and I would quite happily kind of uh, advise other people to give it a go as well. If you're listening along to the pod and you know next week we're doing Pulp Fiction, when you're watching it to think about what you would want people to talk about or what you want to discuss, it changes how you just, it adds another element and another layer to it. It's wicked. I'm, I'm loving it, mate. And I can't wait to do Pulp Fiction. Well, until next week, mate, but thank you for everyone for who has listened or who has watched um, as ever, you know what content online is like now. If you do like what we're doing, please share it. Please follow our social channels. Um, just tell a mate. If you've got a mate who likes films, you like talking to your mates about films, like some people like to do, just say, listen to these other two mates talking about films. Why not? <laughs> do you know what I mean? Why not? 
Um, but I, 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 can you just basically hear, Ben, I'm trying to say anything other than like and subscribe. Maybe I should just, <laughs> yeah, uh, find maybe we should just cut to the chase. Like and subscribe. Yeah, and, and we haven't got a Patreon, so send us money direct. <laughs> Paper envelopes, fine. <laughs>